My name's Dan, and I came to work at Neuralink after following a career in visual neuroscience research. I was inspired to join this company because I saw in our device the potential to restore vision to people rendered blind by eye injury or disease. There are a number of particular characteristics of our device that make it uniquely suited to this application. Firstly, as well as being able to record from every channel, we can stimulate neural activity in the brain by injecting current through every channel. This is important because it allows us to bypass the eye and generate a visual image in the brain directly. Secondly, our device can have an enormous number of electrodes. For a visual prosthesis, this is important because the more electrodes you can have, the higher density of an image you can create in the brain. Thirdly, thanks to our robot, we can insert these electrodes deeply into the brain. Now, this is an important thing for a visual prosthesis because the human visual cortex is buried deeply in a fold in the medial face of the brain called the calcarine sulcus. In this image, I've highlighted the calcarine sulcus in red in an MRI. It contains a map of the visual world, the visual field. It's about a surface area equal to a credit card on each side. And if you unfold it and flatten it, you see that the image is inverted, it's upside down. But more interestingly, it's, mag it's distorted so that the central part of the visual field, the fixation point, is greatly magnified. So for example, if you look at this image of Lincoln, if you look directly into his right eye, everything to the left of that fixation point is directed to your right visual cortex, and everything to the, l to the right goes to your left visual cortex. His eye, even though it's very small in the image, is magnified in the brain to occupy nearly a, a quarter of the surface area of the visual cortex. Over the last half century, visual neuroscientists have developed a profound understanding of visual processing in the brain. What's driven most of this research is recording from single cells in the cortex, usually of macaque monkeys. One of the seminal discoveries was that every cell in the visual cortex represents only a tiny part of the visual field. Your perception is made up of a mosaic of tiny receptive fields, each belonging to a single cell in your visual cortex. So if you record from one of these cells in a monkey, say, in this location, you can find a very tiny region of the screen where a light stimulus will cause modulation of that neuron. Another location in visual cortex will have a location elsewhere on the screen, in this case in the lower visual field. These regions are called receptive fields. We've inserted our device into the visual cortex of two rhesus monkeys, whose names are Code and Dash. That means we can record activity from their visual cortex generated by their, nor their normal home environment as they roam around. But as we all know, monkeys love banana smoothie. That means we can easily teach them to fixate points on a screen and reward them. We can reward them very precisely because we can track the location of their eye using an infrared camera. One of the things this allows us to do is to plot the receptive fields for every neuron that we can record with a single device. Now we do this by showing the animal a movie of random checkerboards whilst he fixates steadily on the screen. Then we take only the frames of the movie that generated a response in the cell and average them all together. This is a technique known as reverse correlation. It's generally used quite widely in, in visual neuroscience for this purpose. And this is an example of a receptive field plotted with this technique. The central cross is the fixation point, and you can see the little red and blue regions of excitatory and inhibitory receptive field. These regions give cortical cells some of their characteristic properties. So we can record all the receptive fields from all the electrodes at the same time. And if we take all these receptive fields and accumulate them together, overlap them, and place them on a on a computer monitor for scale at a typical viewing distance, you begin to get an idea of how much of the visual field we can cover with this preliminary device. 
many of the receptive fields are close to the fovea, to, close to the fixation point. Uh, that's partly due to the magnification that I talked about of the fovea. But there's also a scattering of fields in the periphery. These are from uh, recording sites deeper in the brain, in the calcarine sulcus. So far, I've only talked about recording information from the cortex. But to produce a visual prosthesis, we need to stimulate. So, if we stimulated the cells whose receptive fields are in this location, we would produce a perception of a flash in that location that only the monkey can see. How do we know that the monkey sees it? How do we know what it looks like? Well, unfortunately, we can't ask them what they see, but we can train them to tell us something about that phosphine. We start by training the monkey to fixate a central point on the screen, like this white dot, and we start by presenting real visual stimuli on the screen and rewarding the monkey for making eye movements toward those stimuli. So here we flash a white dot, and the monkey makes an eye movement towards it, symbolized by the green arrow. We then choose another random location and reward the monkey for, for making an eye movement towards it. Once he's got good at this task, we can begin to interleave these real stimuli with electrical stimulation of electrodes and produce a phosphine. The monkey sees the flash and naturally makes a saccade towards it. This tells us not only where in the visual field the flash occurred, but we can also change the current that we inject in that electrode to see how often he makes that saccade, how noticeable or how big perhaps the stimulation the phosphine is that we're producing. Let's look at code performing this task. I want to show you first at one quarter speed, uh, there's a visual flash and he makes an eye movement towards it. We, the monkey can only see what is white on this screen. He can't see his own eye movement and he can't, certainly can't see when we stimulate. But here we stimulate and he makes the same saccade to the same location because we stimulated the same electrode. Nothing appears on the screen at that time and he has no other cue to make that eye movement. Let me show you this in real time. You can see monkey, monkeys like to work very quickly. And when we stimulate, he makes that saccade in real time. And looks like he's had enough. So what I've shown you is a way to produce a phosphine in the visual field. This is not something new in visual neuroscience. But if you think about that phosphine as a single pixel in a visual image, all we need to do is scale up and produce a great many more pixels and have them covering the visual field. This is a schematic of what a visual prosthesis using our N1 device, device might look like. A camera, the output from a camera, would be processed by an iPhone, for example, which would then stream the data to the device and the image would be converted into a pattern of stimulation of the electrodes into visual cortex. With a thousand electrodes, we might be able to produce an image resembling something that you see there on the right. But as Avanesh told you, our next generation of the device will have 16,000 electrodes. If you put a device on both sides of your visual cortex, that would give you 32,000 points of light to make an image in someone who's blind. Our goal will be to turn the lights on for someone who's spent decades living in the dark. <laughs>